topic is on the South in the long shadow of global war. During the 20th century, Americans long struggled with reconstruction of war-torn lands. The almost accidental creation of a foreign empire followed, uh, following the war against Spain, uh, some people know it as the Spanish-American War, others know it as the War Against Spain, in 1898 confirmed what Southerners and Northerners learned two generations earlier. Building an empire is relatively easy if you know how to fight unconventional warfare or otherwise adapt new technology in unconventional ways. As bloody and as detrimental to human life the fighting may be, it's the victory that proved to be the most difficult. From the Civil War forward, Americans became quick to go to war, but had little idea on what to do when they won. The reconstruction of the American South was the first case in point, and it stood as a departure from antebellum and colonial American warfare. Uh, antebellum and colonial Americans knew how to fight, they knew what their goals would be, and they knew how to settle the peace. From the Aroostook Valley conflict under President John Adams to the Mexican War, Americans went to battle with a single postbellum plan intact. It was easy. Fight foreign colonial powers, get their land, and settle it with Americans. Simple. Fighting Indians may have proved to be a different matter, but only to the extent that Americans had to learn how to defeat them. And once they learned how to defeat Indians using basically Indian warfare tactics and strategies, they were able to translate that over to fighting Europeans. Um, and in many ways, this translation continued into the 20th and even to the 21st century. Um, uh, Geronimo remains... Um, the most popular, widely known uh, American Indian and American uh, Reformed uh, Presbyterian, though I think he's actually Dutch, uh, uh, Dutch Reformed, um, <laughs> only because um, Indian warfare has been carried by Americans throughout the world. <clears throat> the settlement pattern remained the same, as I said, whether it's fighting Indians or colonial powers, um, there was no issue with identity or culture as Americans who settled in those areas brought with them exactly what new culture should be erected uh, and they otherwise disenfranchised or segregated conquered groups like Indians or the French or the Spanish. And in many cases, those groups voluntarily segregated themselves uh, as was the case with the French uh, or in many ways, as the case in the Spanish, they simply left. But beginning in 1862, further in 1863, and quite starkly in 1864, northern armies quickly discovered that the common practice of conquest, then settlement, did not work when other Americans already occupied that land. Numerous Union generals confronted by force what politicians and intellectuals had long asked up until the Civil War. Were Southerners Americans or were they something else? The answer that Northern occupying generals provided spanned a number of sophisticated answers and included yes, no, and maybe. To some degree, the severity of Reconstruction depended upon where the occupying commander fell on that pendulum of answers. If they thought Southerners were Americans, Reconstruction typically went light. If they thought uh, Southerners were un-American and deserved punishment for being un-American, Reconstruction was typically severe. <clears throat> Efforts commenced to relocate good Northerners into the South. Some to good effect, but most were not. 
In the end, many carpetbaggers either gave up and returned to the north, or they settled down and adopted many, if not all, southern folkways for themselves and for their children. Cut down the trees, but hunt like a redneck. Made sense. So if the goal were pacification, <clears throat> pacification of the white south, during Reconstruction, that goal was primarily met by disenfranchising the white population, ensuring that the freed black population continued to work and produce cotton or other crops, and that all Southerners, black or white, continued to furnish raw materials and food for Northern factories and Northern people. To the extent that folkways were touched, ladies and gentlemen, it was largely residual to changing legal restrictions and property rights, such as the imposition of fence laws for cattle grazing, inland navigation of waterways, city zoning measures, uh, the development of a public education system, and racial segregation. That was largely to the extent in which culture was um, uh, affected in Reconstruction, which meant for the most part it was, it was, it was unaffected for, for most people in the South. In other words, by, uh, by and large, changing the minds of Southerners or their daily habits was not on the minds of Reconstruction leaders. What mattered most was exercising political power. Power, that was the solution. If only Northerners could maintain political power in the South, all would be well. And whatever needed to be done to ensure Northern political power must be done to achieve Northern political power. Folkways, symbols, accents, music, food, these things were not foremost on the mind of Reconstruction leaders. Uh, symbols were a different issue. Of course, uh, Confederate battle flags were, were, were illegal. They're not, uh, they're not going around waving Confederate battle flags in, in Reconstructed uh, Southern states. By the mid-1870s, though, in the North, Reconstruction was widely viewed as a failure, not only in consequence but also and especially in terms of its goals. Southern society could not be reconstructed. The minds of Southerners would not change, nor would their habits in common life. Try as they may, it became increasingly difficult for Northern intellectuals and politicians to justify claims that Southerners were anything but Americans. And if you can't beat them, you might as well join them, especially if they can cook better than you. And join them they did. As early progressive intellectuals in the, in the late 19th century embraced the existence of Southern regional identity, Southern symbols, and the export of Southern culture from the South to all points North and West and even abroad. This came in the form of literature, music, food, and especially the export of Southern people as blacks moved to northern factory towns and as whites uh, moved out west to places like California. Images of the Confederacy became progressive images, as did Confederate place names, battlefields, and memorials. Together, the existence of these things proved to progressive intellectuals that pesky cultural values and regional identities would never again be strong enough to undermine progressive values. They kept these things around, in other words, to remind themselves of the primacy of science, rationalism, scientific management, and a host of progressive reforms that would turn America into a modern state. We can allow for these symbols, ladies and gentlemen, in the early 20th century, because they were no real threat. 
and they're not considered a real threat by progressive intellectuals because culture didn't matter. What mattered were the ideas. The ideas of scientism, the ideas of rationalism, the ideas of, of Taylorism or scientific management, the ideas of progressivism. <clears throat> but progress inevitably, in their mind, triumphed over resistance each and every time. Culture did not matter. It was no wonder then that progressive intellectuals and leaders from Teddy Roosevelt to Woodrow Wilson relished being associated with the South. It was harmless and even fun. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, in fact, uh, became the teddy bear uh, because of a hunting trip into Mississippi uh, sometime in June, July. Uh, I, I forget the exact year, but it was in that period of time. Mississippians did not celebrate the 4th of July uh, because Vicksburg fell, of course, on the 4th of July. Most Southerners did not really celebrate the 4th of July. But when uh, Roosevelt made his famous bear hunt into the Mississippi Delta, uh, he wanted to stop by Vicksburg on the 4th of July. And uh, townspeople looked at each other and said, well, I guess we're going to have to come up with something. And uh, so they, they, had a, they didn't have a parade. They had some sort of meeting. Uh, but it was on that trip that uh, a northern newspaper cartoonist uh, drew the cartoon of the teddy bear. That's where it came from. Even in the, the South produced teddy bears. <clears throat> Southern culture, white, black. Even Brown posed a threat only to those people outside of the South who could not sing, dance, or eat good, good food. Indeed, when it seemed um, that progressivism in general or divisions of progressivism in particular may not secure political office in the early 20th century, progressive politicians of both major parties, Democrat and Republican, quickly turned to a Southern strategy long before Richard Nixon deployed that term in the 1970s. Progressive leaders donned cowboy hats or white suits, flew the Confederate flag, and spoke praises to Confederate heroes that their own Union ancestors begrudgingly slaughtered. Again, culture really did not matter as much as gaining and holding political power. But something was happening. At the same time, progressives gained their place over American politics. They achieved their goal of, of gaining and maintaining political power. Things seemed to be working against them. The modern era of human history what we call modernity, reached its zenith in the worst military confrontation the world had ever known. Two global wars, an international financial collapse, and a long-running Cold War between a bipolarized world did untold amounts of damage. We still don't know. We may never know the amount of damage that was caused. Uh, in World War I, nearly 14 million people died with a total destructive cost of around, uh, in 1919 terms, 300 billion. It's in the trillions by today's terms. World War II cost approximately 55 million lives and trillions of dollars in destruction. Combining the loss of life and the wealth, the loss of wealth of the Great Depression, the Spanish flu epidemic, in the 1920s, and the Russian Revolution of the 19-teens and into the 20s uh, combined resulted in similar losses of wealth and lives as that of the World Wars. Add to that the Cold War and its assorted conflicts in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, as well as the Cultural Revolution in China. Well, I, I think you get the picture. At precisely the moment that progressives could claim complete victory, they were suffering their worst defeats. Their world was on fire. 
and culture was being burned, as were lives, property, and untold uh, artistic masterpieces. It is only due to the power of progressive rhetoric and their control of information that we do not lay all of these things at their feet. Uh, in fact, why we do not blame progressives for these things is something that I'll eventually come to explain either today or in the next presentation. Um, but what I would like to do is, is turn my attention back to the shadow of, of war. Confronting the horrors of total war, progressives believe that the, um, they, they, they had to deal with this dilemma that I mentioned at the beginning uh, that had faced American military expeditions. You could went, build the empire, but you couldn't secure the victory. Uh, victory was one thing. Fighting the battles was another. To some extent, this is always a problem, but for American policymakers during the 20th century, it was a special case because they largely did not know what to do. And let me go through these, if I can, one by one. Spain um, uh, just lasted a few months in 1898. Um, following the American victory over, over Spain, which obviously didn't take a whole lot, um, you know, it made for a few heroes like Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, progressives followed the strategy of dealing with Spanish territories almost exactly the way the Spanish had dealt with those territories when they conquered them from, from uh, Western Hemispheric Indians um, or, 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 or Polynesian Indians. Um, their strategy was simply, let's not worry about colonization at all. Remember, the typical strategy for Americans had been conquer, then settle. Following the Spanish-American War, we're not going to settle anybody. We're just going to conquer. Let's let companies go in and worry about problems on the ground. As long as we can secure the protection of corporations and their corporate um, legitimacy in these areas, everything will be okay. In other words, wealth extraction became the norm for American, American colonial empire, the, the, the empire. Uh, this was the norm in the Caribbean, in the Philippines, and in Polynesia. Just as it was the norm when Spain controlled these areas starting in the 1500s. Didn't really work out very well, and as soon as we could uh, release these colonies, uh, people thought the better. World War I. Again, conquest and settlement were not options. But neither was the presence of American businesses in European markets, which remained operational during and after the war. Still beholden to European banking practices and interests, even though Americans now rival them, a few American businessmen in the 1920s took the initiative to enter European markets in a big way. Uh, there are notable exceptions like um, um, John D. Rockefeller, though Rockefeller's main point of concern was with uh, competing Russian oil interests, not so much with Western Europeans. Overcoming cultural obstacles only concerned a few intellectuals, not businessmen, not political leadership. So again, culture didn't matter. Culture was not an issue. Don't worry about it. Let's just get uh, institutions in place. Indeed, that was the only thing that most American intellectuals and politicians emphasized. Get the institutions right following World War I. Strangely enough, the British, French, and American positions presented by the leadership of these countries following World War I looked vaguely similar to that of Northerners following the Civil War. Politics and power were all that mattered. Keep the Germans weak. Ensure that political sovereignty swept through smaller European countries and protect international trade. Don't worry about changing the hearts and the minds of Germans. Don't worry about changing the hearts and minds of the Italians. After all, that always changes, right? They're fighting on one side, switch to the other. Anyway, um, um, don't, don't, don't concern yourself with these matters. 
Uh, instead, all would be well regulated through a supranational institution known as the League of Nations, whose ministries would work behind the scenes to protect the new world order. As long as the right people remained in power, the right institutions would work to soften the blows of capitalism and diminish the darkness of false thinking. Indeed, financial recovery for Europe mattered as about as much as it did to northern leaders during Reconstruction. Now, let me again let me repeat this, make sure everyone's following along. For European and American leaders after World War I, what mattered was simply getting the most powerful institutions right. It's power, right? It's power. It's not, not so much money. It's not ideas. It's not culture. If you just get the institutions right, which we, will, of course, will run, everything will be okay. Um, it's very similar, as I, as I said, to what Northerners thought during uh, the Reconstruction of the South after the war. It may be okay. Just make sure we run things. It's all right. Um, as long as raw materials and trade flowed, and as long as defeated governments paid reparations, all should be well. Culture did not matter. Now, the success of this progressive strategy can be seen in World War II which meant it was not successful at all. Uh, this demanded a new response, and I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but let me draw a very stark comparison with the way Americans approach the, the, the end of World War I with the way we approach the end of World War II. Americans approached World War I under the leadership of Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Y'all all have heard of fake news. Uh, we can think of Wilson as fake Southerner. Uh, he, he is often claimed uh, to be a Southerner, uh, but it, uh, anyone who's done any serious research on these connections would be hard-pressed to identify much that's in Wilson that is identifiably Southern. Even his more um, um, uh, extreme racism and rancor um, could just as easily be traced to other places where he, where he lived besides the South. But for these folks, again, just get the institutions right. Hmm? Make sure we run them, make sure we occupy them, we have offices of power, everything will be okay. New world order. World War II is different. In the closing days of World War II, the United States Congress formed two special committees which would be tasked with devising plans of reconstructing defeated lands. These committees, uh, ideas behind these committees were formulated as late as 1944. Uh, the structure of these committees was put in place around 1945. Uh, they did their work 90, uh, in 45, 46, 47, leading up to major events in, in 48. The committees and those who directed them in the United States State Department were comprised largely of Southerners. Uh, Secretary of State George Marshall, though born in Pennsylvania, spent his early adulthood at, in Virginia. Um, we attended the Virginia Military Institute and later served in one of his first jobs as Commandant of the Danville Military Academy in Southside, Virginia. Senator Claude Pepper of Florida chaired the, 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 the Senate Post-War Planning Committee, and Congressman William Bill Calmer of Mississippi chaired the, the, the same Post-War Planning Committee in the House of Representatives. Calmer, by the way, uh, was in, uh, his district was in South Mississippi where um, um, uh, Ryan's alma mater, my alma mater, Southern Mississippi, is located. What we find in the work of these two committees is something extraordinary. Uh, we seem to have forgotten this, but the, this extraordinary thing these, these guys discovered is that financial recovery actually matters. Making certain that defeated lands are placed on a proper financial footing solves a lot of problems going forward. Uh, financial recovery is essential. 
Trade and manufacturing must commence, and relationships through trade must be secured. Now, culture was not their focus. For these men, culture, well, it was assumed, would be protected and that ideologies that had cost the world so many lives in the early 20th century were an aberration, an exception to the rule of human thinking. They were an aberration in their minds, right? If we just get the economies right, then the ideas will fall into place in right and in good order. Um, ideology was an aberration, as I said, a product of economic depression, not anything endemic in Western, European, or American thought. Now, we'll come back to this in just a moment. It's important to, to remember this part of the story. For congressional post-war leaders, they did not see ideology as a key issue. They thought ideological thinking was an exception to the rule. It was an aberration. If you just get the economy right, everything else would fall into order. As we'll see here in just a moment, though, the European response was very different. But needless to say, for American businessmen, and I must admit, even those uh, Southerners who ran post-war planning probably fell more in a Hamiltonian tradition than a, a decidedly Jeffersonian one. Um, they cared little about folkways, about daily habits, about culture, about the kinds of things that, that motivate our lives on a regular basis. What they were really interested in is making sure that they could sell stuff. Uh, and perhaps selling culture to Europeans was a part of that. But money, not folkways and ideas, was the bottom line. As I said, the European response was very different. And here it is necessary to dramatically turn our attention away from warfare and politics to modern intellectual life and the emergence of ideological thinking. So take a deep breath, stretch. We're going to move to another thing and come back to the warfare stuff in just a moment. It might behoove us to pause in our conference and ask some important questions. What exactly is ideology? Where does it come from? Why is it a problem? Now, I'll leave the answers to these questions uh, to uh, the philosophers we know best and dearly love. Um, but allow me to provide a, a, a brief definition just for the sake of my argument. First, ideology is a specific way of thinking. It is not something that everybody has. Now, in our way of conversing uh, in, in, in modern political parlance, uh, in, in government classes and history classes, and uh, regular conversation and talk radio, we throw out this word ideology to mean a lot of different stuff. And this is part of the problem. Once we carefully define ideology, you'll see that, we, that the, the, the problem's in a better light and solutions will come forward as well. Roger Scruton. Uh, the great British conservative, who I, I must admit has um, um, had a great impact early in my life, wrote in his 1982 Dictionary of Political Thought that ideology is, quote, any systematic and all-embracing political doctrine which claims to give a complete and universally applicable theory of man and society and to derive therefrom a program of political action. In other words, ideology is not simply any set of ideas. It's a set of ideas that work together to achieve a previously unrealized and abstract structure of human existence. All things are viewed through this system of thought. All things are understood through it. And all value is placed upon human action, or all value placed upon human action is held up to this standard, to this system. 
So, uh, there are different terms we might could use that are synonymous with ideology. Worldview might be one of those that's popular among a number of Christians. And perhaps I'm wrong, but it seems that ideological thinking is peculiarly modern in its origin and existence. Early signs of ideological thinking were resisted by philosophers such as the Scotsman David Hume, or ridiculed by the English satirist Jonathan Swift in works of his such as Gulliver's Travels. Edmund Burke, the so-called founder of modern conservatism, called ideology armed doctrines and saw its origin in the early stages of the French Revolution. Thomas Jefferson seemed to see similar features in the Federalist Party in 1798 and described ideological thinking as, quote, a season of witches. I love that phrase, season of witches. At nearly the same time, in the 1790s, Napoleon Bonaparte, this may be the only time Anyone at the Abbeville Institute says something positive about Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, yeah, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte coined the term ideologue, ideologue, to describe these people. And it was not a term of endearment. Amore, ideologue, it was not the same, not synonymous. So ideological thinking is the belief that present reality must be replaced with a rationalistic plan or strategy of what the good life ought to be. Everything must be swept away and replaced by rationalized definitions of how human beings ought to think, ought to act, ought to behave, ought to love, ought to hate, ought to resist, ought to act, ought to eat, ought to listen, ought to perform artistic crafts, all replaced by the ideology. Ideology often behaves like a religion. People do not ask many questions since all answers must be filtered through the lens of the overarching idea. And of course, we could probably all agree that bona fide religion invites questions but not ideology. One of the key signs of a person being an ideologue is they don't ask questions. They only have answers. Ideology can, in fact, be based on religious ideas, especially perfectionist versions of Christianity or even conservative versions of Islam. It has been asked time and again Um, about the nature of Calvinism and Puritanism and its role in New England culture and the development of the Yankee as opposed to the development of the Southerner. And it's an important question that a lot of us are always asking and trying to answer. It seems to me the problem is not so much Calvinism. The problem is when Puritans in New England turn Calvinism and religious orthodoxy into an ideology. And by that I mean when they insist that all things, all aspects of human existence must be interpreted through a peculiar or particular way of glorifying God. We've had a number of people speak to this over the years. Um, And let's just say it this way. Um, When people are trying to figure out how going to the bathroom glorifies God, Um, uh, you know you've got an ideology, folks, right? It's a fair measure to say that any word ending with the letters I-S-M is an ideology. Ism, feminism, Marxism, liberalism, progressivism, conservatism. Vegetarianism. I can... Graham, what Clyde used to call it, Graham crackerism. <laughs> if we take Scruton's definition of ideology, uh, as well as my explanations, you can see that there is no room in ideological 
thinking for custom and tradition. Ideas are what matter. Culture does not. You must get those ideas right if you are to create the perfect system, which in turn humanity must embrace and live by. Ideas matter. Maybe culture does not. Indeed, culture not only has no place in ideological thinking, folkways, habits of common life, tradition, custom, traditional religion, all of these things cause people to resist the right ideas and undermine the ability of ideologues to impose their abstractions upon reality. So I've been saying time and time again, culture doesn't matter. But in fact, for ideologues, culture does matter. It matters a lot. But it always matters in a negative way. So by definition, or at least the definition I've produced here, uh, ideology and culture, genuine culture, are incommensurable. They, they, they cannot coexist. And by culture, again, I mean tradition, I mean habits, I mean those unspoken things that, that guide people's life and root them uh, in their, 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 their daily ways of doing things. Both Marxism and liberalism came to nominate 19th century European intellectual life. Both struggle to gain the upper hand in terms of ideological thinking over the other during the 20th century, and in many ways Marxism and liberalism become the real ideological poles that uh, your, uh, people in the Western world are, um, have to deal with. And that brings us back to the European response to World War II. <clears throat> Remember that I mentioned that the American response to World War II was You've got to rebuild these countries, whether it be Japan, whether it be uh, Germany, whether it be France, whether it be Russia. In fact, members of the House of Representatives Post-War Planning Committee, uh, they actually met with Joseph Stalin to figure out ways in which American money could be funneled uh, to the Soviet Union and help rebuild it. Now, those of you who have um, um, any memory or experience with post-World War II history, you no doubt realize that the culminating effects of the House Post-War Planning Committee and the Senate Post-War Planning Committee under the direction of Secretary of State George Marshall uh, culminated into the Marshall Plan, uh, one of the largest, um, well, what are we going to call it, um, um, bailouts uh, perhaps in, in, in really one of the largest bailouts in human history. I think that's right. I think if we look at what we know of human history, it was one of the largest. But Europeans differed. European intellectuals, whether they be Christian Democrats or socialists, insisted that what must occur is that the old ways be swept aside. Europeans needed new institutions, but they also needed new culture. Every vestige of early governments, every vestige of early ways of organizing society prior to the global wars had to be swept away. Nothing was left intact. Organized religion, traditional philosophy, and schools of thought that had existed in Western civilization literally thousands of years were swept aside. Ways of understanding mathematics, physics, chemistry were put on trial. Art was already in the process of being undermined prior to World War II, but uh, that the, the devastation of that war left really nothing left. The best example of this European response and the defense of ideological thinking is the Frankfurt School, uh, organized in Frankfurt. Actually, I believe it, it predated World War II. Not, it started in the 1930s, I believe. Uh, leading proponents of the Frankfurt School were Theodore Adorno, Mats Horkheimer, and uh, Jürgen Habermas. And Habermas, I believe, is still alive. Douglas, is he still alive, right? Um, again, as it existed prior to World War II, um, um, and World War II in many ways sort of um, uh, justified all the claims they had, had put forward uh, prior to it. 
they attributed the cause of war, the cause of the global wars, to custom, to religion, to tradition, to habit. They attributed the cause of global wars and some to what they identified very specifically as Western civilization. This was the real enemy. And so to them, the cure for all the problems that Europeans faced was to eliminate those traditions that had long been associated with their civilization. For the Frankfurt School, ideas are and were and are supreme. Uh, ideas would be the way in which human beings would be cleansed of their previous beliefs and placed on a new path toward enlightenment and freedom. Um, and so for the European uh, left and the European right, uh, I would lump Christian Democrats into this, this process as well, uh, they basically embark on a total re-education campaign. It wasn't just enough to pacify those elements of their society that might rise up against them. It wasn't just enough to uh, segregate those people that might one day uh, prove to be a challenge. Instead, Europeans embarked on a two-front war against Western civilization. On the one hand was creating new political institutions um, that, 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 that spread across national, national uh, territories and national lines. Uh, new political institutions that would defend human rights and their abstract definition of human rights, new institutions which would defend uh, a standard form of trade, of a very centralized form of controlling economies, institutions that would eventually come together into the European Union. But they also have an intellectual um, 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 uh, plank in which they are pursuing, and that intellectual plank is to undermine anything that smacked of tradition. Any way of thinking that was considered traditional, any, any rootedness of human action in custom or um, 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 of traditional values. In effect, one, well, one of the ways, and I'm, I'm bringing this now to the close, one of the ways in which these uh, Europeans were so successful is that they defined ideology as everything. Remember, the definition I provided to you a few moments ago was that ideology was not just any idea. It was a very specific way of thinking. For the Frankfurt School and others who follow them, and this is now virtually ubiquitous uh, across the English-speaking world, which means it's ubiquitous everywhere, um, is that ideology is any set of ideas, that everyone has an ideology. It's like the old Dr. Pepper commercials. I'm a pepper, you're a pepper. I'm an ideologue, you're an ideologue. Don't you want to be an ideologue too? And, and, and this, is, this is part and parcel of our problem. You see, for the Frankfurt School and their followers, culture became ideology, and ideology became culture. Americans came to experience this in the 1950s as American uh, intellectuals followed the, the path of Clifford Geertz, a noted sociologist, whose own definition of culture was ideolo ideological. In fact, we've already uh, seen some, some results of this in earlier presentations. Uh, 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 David Bryan Davis, uh, Bernard Balin, the ideological origins of um, the American Revolution, right? Uh, Forrest MacDonald's work, the ideological origins of the American Constitution. All of these were rooted in a belief that ideology and culture were synonymous and that ideas were at the heart of this. So for the Frankfurt School, the way of solving these problems, as I mentioned, was to undermine, idea, undermine anything that looked like a previous culture. You simply say that language is an ideological construct. 
You simply argue that the way men have oppressed women over centuries was controlling the language. You simply argue that music becomes, is an, uh, an ideological weapon, that food has ideological origins, that the way we raise our children is rooted in ideology and nothing else. And so if everything is ideology, then you basically find yourself in perpetual ideological warfare. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. For Europeans, at the end of World War II, their reconstruction demanded total obliteration of any rival ideology, which meant total obliteration of any cultural folkway predating those wars. It demanded a destruction of culture, including symbols, ideas, traditions, music, affiliations, hopes, and dreams. Identity had to disappear. Regional, local, national, these were the threats. These were the things that caused civilization to be hurled into uh, a world of discontent. There was a kind of flourishing of Confederate and Southern symbols in progressive America. As I said, those symbols reminded progressives that there, there were deep cultural divisions at one time in the United States, but those divisions have been conquered, defeated by blood and toil, and now held together by their own technocratic skills and managerial institutions. But following World War II, American intellectuals began borrowing from their European counterparts. Now culture mattered. And those symbols, which were once protected even by their intellectual ancestors, were now called into question. During the Civil Rights Movement, it not only highlighted just how deep those old cultural divisions were, in the North, by the way, and just how deep those cultural divisions were in the West, by the way, not just in the South. But no longer would it be enough to simply conquer and maintain political power. Now the symbols themselves had to disappear. <clears throat> now dissent had to be stamped out. Now civilization hung in the balance and must not tolerate those who might tip the scales. No free speech, no free culture. And so for American progressives, Confederate symbols become almost blurred into Nazi symbols. And the culture war continues to rage. Let me leave you with this final comment. The long shadow of those wars is finally beginning to lift. Uh, we now see the culmination of this mindset about ideology, as Europeans are incapable now of resisting any significant threat, both from within and from the outside of their, of their society. And it does appear that the tide is beginning to turn. Uh, when Bill Gates, uh, one of the wealthiest men of the world, can go to Europe and tell the leaders of those countries, enough is enough on the immigration issue, uh, you know that the tide is beginning to turn. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll be prepared. I hope that as the, as the, as the era of ideology begins to disappear, that you are prepared to once again defend common aspects of your culture and your daily life. It doesn't matter whether you're from Alabama or even the West Coast. You need to be able to defend those things that animate your life and make it worth living. 
And as I will note again tomorrow, as I bring this presentation to, to a different angle, a conservatism that cannot defend barbecue is not a conservatism worth defending. Thank you.